Good morning. This morning we are going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 13. Uh, last time we were in 1 Samuel chapter 12, and if you remember what happened in 1 Samuel chapter 12, uh, we saw Saul uh, becoming king. He was being anointed as king. He was becoming king after he had just won the battle back in chapter 11, and the people were all excited about him becoming king. Um, and then Samuel was giving a speech at the coronation, and he was explaining to the people, uh, first and foremost, making sure that he was was okay in their sight. He was okay and not like, uh, you know, owing them anything and, and that they were good with him. Uh, but then also he was rebuking them because they rejected God as king. Um, and, and they weren't realizing that they were rejecting God as king. And so God, he prays to the Lord and says, God, send down thunder and rain. And he does uh, to show them that they were disobedient to God. And so then the people were fearful and they cried out and, and asked Samuel to pray for them. And uh, Samuel prays for them. And, and, and that's fine. Um, and Samuel says, I'm going to make sure I, I show you the way to live. Even though you have a king, even though I'm not, you know, the, the ruler over Israel by, by God through me anymore, um, I'm going to be the priest, I'm going to be the prophet, I'm going to be here to show you the right way to live so that you will walk in the way of the Lord for his glory. And we ended off in verse 25 that said, if you do wickedly, you will be swept away both you and your king. And so there's a warning from Samuel as we end chapter 12 and as we roll into chapter 13. And so chapter 13 starts off kind of weird. Uh, it said, Saul reigned one year, and when he reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose for himself 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and in the mountains of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gebeah of Benjamin. The rest of the people he sent away, every man to his tent. Um, Saul reigned one year and when he had reigned two years. That seems like a weird thing to say. Um, and my, my commentary here has some some interesting things. I'm not really sure what to make of it exactly, but I'll just read it for you um, so you can have the information. It says the original numbers have not been preserved in this text. Uh, it literally read, Saul was one year old when he became king and ruled two years over Israel. Acts 13.21 states that Saul ruled for 40, Israel for 40 years. His age at the ascension is recorded nowhere in scripture Probably the best reconstruction of verses 1 and 2 is that Saul was 1 and perhaps 30 years old, so 31 years old, when he began to reign. And he reigned for two years over Israel. Then Saul chose for himself 3,000 men. And so uh, that's just the kind of way that, that they reconstruct it here in the commentary. John MacArthur does. Um, Take it for what you want uh, to take it for. I don't know. This is kind of a weird piece here to try to discern and, and, and understand exactly what's going on. Obviously, it doesn't have like major implications on our faith or anything like that. Uh, but just trying to make sense of, of that, that first line there is, is interesting to see. But Saul chooses 3,000 men for himself um, and 2,000 were with him at Michmash. In the mountains of Bethel. And so Jonathan also had a thousand. Now Jonathan is Saul's son. We haven't read that anywhere yet, uh, but it, it's listed throughout the scripture. So I'll just let you know. Jonathan is the son of Saul and he is a, a leader in the army of Saul apparently because he has a thousand men under his command. And so it says in verse 3, Jonathan attacked the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba and the Philistines heard of it. And so Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. Now all Israel heard it, that Saul said that, uh, that Saul attacked the garrison of the Philistines, and that the Israel had become an abomination to the Philistines, and the people were called together to Saul at Gilgal. And so Jonathan, his son, goes in and attacks the Philistines. Now, uh, if you know much about the Philistines and the Israelites, they hate each other. Uh, the Philistines are constantly a, uh, a thorn in the Israelite side throughout the scriptures, specifically here in Samuel. Um, even maybe in the book of Judges as well, they were a thorn in their side. They were just constantly back and forth in battles and problems. They, the Philistines were the ones that stole the Ark of the Covenant earlier on that we saw and they had to send it back into the land. And so uh, the Philistines and Israelites are not really good with each other. Uh, they're not really friends. They're frustrated with each other. And so Jonathan goes in and fights them, attacks them. And now he's poked the bear. Uh, the Philistines are frustrated. The Philistines are angry. And so Saul is now calling people together to get ready to go to battle with the Philistines. Um, and when I read this, what it reminds me of is what Samuel said way back when the people said, we want a king so we could be like everybody else. Saul said, 
you guys will not be your own. Whatever the king says will go. You're not going to like that. He's going to take part of your crop, part of your horses, part of your animals, your sons, your daughters. Uh, essentially, he's going to take you to come into battle whenever he wants to. Uh, you're not going to be your own. And so here it is. Saul is summoning the people to come to him so that they can go fight the Philistines. And so it says in verse 5, the Philistines gathered together to fight with Israel. 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand which is on the seashore in the multitude. And they came and encamped at Michmash to the east of Beth Avon. And when the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, for the people were distressed, the people hid in caves, in thickets, in rocks, in holes, and in pits. And some of the Hebrews crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad to, uh, and Gilead. And so as for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and the people followed him trembling. All of a sudden, these people are fearful, they're terrified, they're afraid of the Philistines, they don't have that confidence they did that they had in Saul in the earlier chapters that we read about. They are, are less excited about their king uh, and more nervous that they are not going to survive because they are terrified of the Philistines and the battle that is about to come to take place. So there's people hiding in rocks, there's people hiding in pits, there's people hiding in bushes, they are hiding anywhere and everywhere they can hide so that the Philistines do not come and destroy them. And so they are fearful of what might happen in this battle. And even the ones following Saul are marching behind him, trembling, scared, nervous. So verse 8 says, He waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel. Uh, we saw this happen back in chapter 10 and verse 8. This happened um, where God told him to wait for seven days. Um, and it seems like in chapter 10, he did, in fact, wait for those seven days uh, like he was supposed to. Uh, here it said that he, he uh, where's that? Uh, verse 8, he waited, uh, he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul said, bring a burnt offering and a peace offering here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. And now it happened as soon as he finished presenting the burnt offering that Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him that he might greet him. And Samuel said, what have you done? Saul said, when I saw the people were scattered from me, that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered together at Michmash. Then I said, the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and offered a burnt sacrifice or burnt offering to the Lord. And so what we have here is Samuel said, give me seven days. I'll come down. I'll be with you. Um, we don't exactly see how long it was that Samuel waited. Uh, it seems like seven days and maybe uh, an extra hour. I don't know. Or late on the seventh day, he shows up. But Saul got impatient. And rather than regarding the things of God as holy and set apart and needed here uh, in the way that God had uh, uh, had asked for them to be done, which would be for this priest in Samuel to be present and offering the burnt offering, Saul was deciding that he was just going to go ahead and do it himself. The people were fearful, the people were fleeing, the people were scattering, his army was dwindling down. And what ended up happening was Saul was trusting in what he could see right in front of him, rather than in the Lord. And what that looks like is there's two things that that looks like. One is he was focused on the enemy. He couldn't take his eyes off of the enemy. The enemy was bearing down. He was fear fearful. He even said that right there that uh, I, I said, hey, the Philistines are going to come now on, down on me at Gilgal. He couldn't get his eyes off the enemy. He was terrified that the enemy would conquer him, would defeat him, would beat him. He was scared. And so the second thing that he does here that, that he, he has a problem with is he doesn't have his eyes on God because he has his eyes on his own army and he sees that they are fleeing and his army is dwindling down piece by piece. And that's a problem because as he has his eyes on the army and his eyes on the enemy, his eyes are not on the Lord and the battle belongs to the Lord. And Saul forgot that somewhere along the lines of this year or two years that he reigned. He seems to have forgotten that the battle belongs to God. Now you go back to chapter 11, Saul had victory in that battle and then they crowned him as king. But what did Saul do after that battle? He said, this was the Lord. The Lord delivered us from their hand. 
But somewhere along the lines in this two years of Saul's reign, he has lost sight of the Lord. He has lost sight of the fact that the battle belongs to God. He's finding confidence in the midst of his flesh. He's finding confidence in the midst of his army. He's not looking in the right place. And so in that moment, what he does is he disregarded God as holy and the things of God as holy, where God said that a priest should be present here to be a part of this sacrifice. And so he said, I felt compelled and I offered the burnt offering. And so Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be the commander over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord your God commanded you. Then Samuel arose and went to Gilgal at of Benjamin, and Saul numbered the people present with him at 600 men. He had 3,000, he has 600. That shows the way that the number of people dwindled away. My commentary here says, Saul's disobedience was a direct violation of God's command. Um, additionally, it says somewhere in here, uh, Samuel wanted to test, wanted seven days to test Saul's character in obedience to God, but Saul failed by invading the priestly office himself. And so Saul does not regard what, what God has or orchestrated and ordained as holy, the holy way of sacrifice, where there should be a priest present um, during this time. Saul jumped in and said, hey, I want to be doing this myself. I want to, you know, I, I don't have time to wait on Samuel. I need these people behind me. I need them to know that, that, that it's going to be fine. I don't know. I'm just going to do this myself. And he jumps in and he commits this sin. And so God has now removed the kingdom from uh, Saul. He has no longer got, got God's backing as king. Uh, Samuel has now rejected him because the Lord has rejected him. And, and now there is this peace here that, that is just lingering and, and, and over their head as this, this priest who is God's anointed in Samuel has told Saul, hey, you're done. God isn't with you. He has rejected you as king. Your, your kingdom is not going to be established forever. It's going to be ripped from you. It, 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 you have disobeyed God. If you would have listened to what God said and been obedient, if you would have regarded God as holy, your kingdom would have been established forever. Your son, Jonathan, would have been the king and his son would have been the king and, and it would have been beautiful. But because you rejected God, your kingdom has been removed. And so we just all of a sudden kind of breeze past that and go back into this battle because there's still a war going on. And Samuel has left. He went back to Gilgal or went up from Gilgal to Gebeah. Um, and so now it says in verse 16, Saul, Jonathan, his son, and the people present with them remained at Gebeah of Benjamin. But the Philistines encamped at Michmash and the raiders came out of the camp and the Philistines in three companies. One company turned into the road uh, to Ophrah to the land of Shul. Another company turned to the road at Beth Horon. Another company turned to the road at the border that overlooks the valley of Zeboim toward the wilderness. Now there was no blacksmith to be found through all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, Lest Hebrews make swords or spears, but all the Israelites will go down to the Philistines to sharpen the man's plow, uh, each man's plowshare, his mattock, his axe, his sickle, and charge sharpening. Uh, the charge for sharpening was a pim for the plowshares, the mattox, the forks, the axes to set the points of the goad. Uh, it says a pim was about two thirds shekel weight. I don't know if that means anything to you, uh, but just a, a form of measurement of pay. Essentially, it was a high form of pay. They had to pay a, decent, a, a high amount. There was no blacksmiths in Israel. That's a problem. And the reason that's a problem is because they could not sharpen their weapons. They could not make their weapons. They could not be prepared for battle. Uh, the Philistines made it so. I don't know how they made it so necessarily. Um, but, but perhaps none of the Israelites were trained to be blacksmiths. I don't know. Uh, but the Philistines were. 
and they decided they weren't going to help Israel out at all. They would only sharpen their equipment for farming, and that was it. My commentary actually says that the Philistines had superior iron and metalworking craftsmen until David's time, accounting for the formidable military force. And really, if you know much about like uh, ancient biblical military history, what you'll, you'll realize is that the people that have the better weapons are the ones that generally win. And I don't say that in terms of with Israel, because when God is with Israel, Israel wins. And it doesn't matter who's got the better weapons. It matters that God is with them. But other than that, when you see we, nations going against each other, what you'll see is you'll see people with, with better swords or people with better shields or better people, whatever it is, whoever's got the better military weapons, whoever's got the better things that, that, are, that are crafted, they tend to win. Whether that's chariots, whether that's weapons, whatever that looks like, whoever's more advanced seems to have the advantage. And so here, what it would seem to, to man's eye is that the Philistines have the advantage because Israel does not have good weapons, nor do they have blacksmiths to sharpen their weapons. However, if God is with them, they will win this battle because the Lord is, is the one who's fighting on behalf of Israel. And uh, if you want to talk about a better military weapon, there is no better, better weapon than the Lord. The Lord can fight on behalf of Israel, and not, whatever the Lord says is going to happen, is going to happen for his glory and his honor. Um, but what we're seeing here is that they do not have good weapons. So it came to pass on that day that the, uh, uh, sorry, it came to came about on that day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in any of the hands of the people who were with Saul and Jonathan, but they were found with Saul and Jonathan, his son. And so only Saul and Jonathan have weapons. Nobody else seems to have a weapon. They're not properly prepared to go into battle. Now that would make you even more nervous uh, than you were before when you found out the Philistines were coming and people were hiding in rocks and all these other places. They don't have a weapon. So that's a problem. If you don't have a weapon and you're going to battle and only your king and his son seem to have some weapons, then that's going to not be the, the thing you want uh, to happen. That's not going to give you a lot of faith and confidence. And so it says the garrison of the Philistines went out on the pass at Michmash. And so that's where that scripture actually ends. And chapter 14 is where we see more of the battle take place. But what I want to say here um, is that as we wrap up that chapter, you, you see these swords only in Saul and Jonathan's hands. So I just want to go back and focus on that uh, because what it would be for us as we read this scripture is it's easy for us to say, hey, there's only a couple swords. They're definitely going to lose. Uh, we don't know that for sure. We need to read the next chapter. Um, we would also say because Saul was rejected as king, they're probably going to lose. Uh, and it just doesn't look good for Israel here. But for us, we need to be careful because if we're not careful, we're going to fall right into the trap that Saul fell into. And rather than looking at the Lord and keeping our eyes fixed on God, even in the midst of this battle that we're reading about here, we can get our eyes fixed on the enemy of the Israelites and the Philistines. We can get our eyes fixed on the fact that Israel doesn't have weapons when really God is the one that fights on their behalf. And whatever God says is going to happen is going to happen. And so likewise, when we come to our lives, when we come to our battles, when we come to our struggles, when we come to our problems in the world, we can't be focused on the stuff that surrounds us because there's a lot of garbage out there. There's a lot of people trying to tell you things. There's a lot of messages trying to invoke fear in people. There's a lot of, a lot of uh, distractions out there when things are going to look bleak. We can't look at what the world says. We need to look at what the Lord says, what God says. Uh, and, and what God says is what's most important. And we don't know necessarily all the time what God's going to do or how God's going to move. But we do know that God says, bring your concerns to me. Bring your problems to me. Cast your cares on me because I care for you. And when the battle looks bleak in our life, when things look like they're struggling, when things look like they're going to fall apart, when things look like they're going to break, we need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and we need to come to him in prayer and realize that the battle belongs to him, that the battle belongs to the Lord, that the Lord is over everything going on in our life. And so we cast our cares upon him. We cast our concerns upon him. We cast our problems on him. We keep our eyes fixed 
upon him and we remember the good things that God has done, the way that God has shown up, the way that God has moved. We mentioned that in the last chapter that, that Samuel recounted what God had done, how he delivered them from the hand of the Egyptians, how he raised up judges and utilized judges, but God really was the one that fought the battles and delivered them time and time again. And so for us, we remember the things that God has done. We remember that he defeated death on the cross and so that no matter what happens to us here on this life and on this earth, that when we have this relationship and life in Jesus, we know we're going to be with him forever and that this is not the end. We know that whatever we're facing, that God says he works it together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. We know that God tells us in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, uh, I think I got that right. It's not the other way around. He says, lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. So God is never going to leave us. He's never going to forsake us. The Holy Spirit is inside of us. And so no matter what we're facing today, we need to keep our eyes fixed on God. We need to stand on the promises that God has given us, that we would not be, be waving and, and uh, wiggling around, but that we would stand strong and firm on what God is telling us and communicating to us for his glory and his honor. Because God is with us in the midst of the battle. The enemy might look bigger. The enemy might have more weapons. The enemy might be stronger. But at the end of the day, it is the Lord that fights on our behalf. And it is the Lord that goes with us in the problems of this life and the struggles of this life. And there's nothing too big for God. And we serve a God that does great things, who works in marvelous, miraculous ways. We need to trust him. We need to have faith in him. And we need to fix our eyes on him. Because when we get our eyes on the enemy, that's just going to bring in fear and doubt and worry and concern. But when our eyes are fixed on Jesus, it brings peace, it brings comfort, and it brings hope. Because he is the God that is bigger than anything that we are going to face today, tomorrow, whatever day that might be. God goes before us in everything. So keep your eyes fixed on the Lord. That was 1 Samuel chapter 13. We'll look at 1 Samuel chapter 14 next week. Um, but we're going to go ahead and close out in prayer here. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that the battle belongs to you, that it's not belonging to us, God. It's all yours, God. We surrender it to you. We submit it to you. We lay it down before your feet, Jesus. God, we give it over to you today. Lord, everyone that's listening to this is going through something different, God. Forgive us for keeping our eyes fixed on the problem. Forgive us for our eyes being fixed on our own solutions. God, let our eyes be fixed on you. Let us cast our cares upon you today, God. Whatever everyone's going through, Lord, let it, let it be laid down at your feet, knowing that you're with us in all things. And we thank you for the hope that you've given us, Jesus, in the cross. We thank you for the blessing of life that you've given us, Jesus, by giving your life on the cross that we have life in you. We thank you that your spirit is alive and well inside of us, going with us everywhere that we go. We thank you that you promise never to leave us or forsake us. We thank you, God, that, that you're with us in the midst of these problems, in the midst of these battles, Jesus, and you're working all things together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. And we pray, Jesus, that you would just move in our lives for your kingdom and your glory in all things. Lord, we pray for Forever Grace Church that you continue to be at work here in this place. Lord, that you would give wisdom to leadership as we move forward here in this place. That you would give guidance and direction for your kingdom and your glory and your honor, God. That we would have our eyes fixed on you in the midst of it all. And Lord, we just pray that you would bless this place, Jesus. That we would go in the way that you want us to go. That your name would be lifted up. That Forever Grace would be a light in this community for your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys for listening. We'll be back next time to do 1 Samuel chapter 14.